Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today's episode was actually inspired by our coworker Julie. Uh, Again? Is, <laughs> yes. Uh, Julie and I hang out a lot, so I get lots of cool stuff from her. Uh, but also, she just came back from a trip through the American Southwest. And when she came back, we had lunch, and she was talking about Mary Russell Colton uh, with such fascination and delight that I was like, I'm going to look this person up and we'll maybe do a show on her. And we did. Uh, Mary Russell Farrell Colton was a painter. We're not going to talk a lot about her painting. Uh, we'll mention it, but uh, she was also an author and an educator. But the thing that makes her the most famous is the co-founding of the Museum of Northern Arizona and related programs and projects intended to preserve and continue the art traditions of the Colorado Plateau. So, quick <laughs> geographical reminder slash overview. The Colorado Plateau overlaps the Four Corners region of the southwestern United States, which is where Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona all meet. And it is, per the National Park Service, quote, one of the world's premier natural showcases for Earth history. There are volcanic mountains, plateaus, buttes, and canyons, and a lot of national parks in the area. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things I I feel like people don't always think about how much human history is contained in these areas as well. We sort of associate, I've talked about it before, archaeology is something that happens elsewhere. <laughs> but it, it's very, uh, there are a lot of really impressive uh, digs that have happened in the area. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. In Flagstaff, Arizona, which becomes a really focal point of Mary Russell Colton's story, is on the southern edge of the Colorado Plateau. And there are six different ecological zones that can all be experienced within a 100 miles of Flagstaff and a wealth of history going back into prehistory. So it's a pretty incredible place. There are a lot of Native American tribes in the area as well, including the Zuni, Havasupai, uh, Navajo, Hopi, Ute, Wallapai, Southern Paiute, and Paiute. Uh, and because Mary Russell Colton worked with several of those uh, Native American tribes, that is why we mention them in this little intro piece. But now we're going to transition specifically to Mary Russell's story. She was born Mary Russell Farrell in Louisville, Kentucky on March 25th, 1889, to parents Joseph Librant Farrell, an engineer, and Elise Houston. The Houston side of the family was wealthy and filled with really prominent members of society. Her grandfather was Chief Justice of Tennessee's Supreme Court, and they were related to Sam Houston, the seventh governor of Texas. And through marriage, they were related to James K. Polk. As a child, Mary Russell was curious and inquisitive, and she loved learning, but her education in her younger years was pretty informal. She was drawn to art from the time she was small, though, and she had decided that it would be her career path before she became a teenager. When Mary was just 15, her father Joseph died suddenly. And while he had been a really good provider and had done well for himself, at the time of his passing, the family was in a tight situation financially. They had just, you know, kind of had one of those little dips of income. And unfortunately, that is when he died. So Elise, her mother, was forced to sell items from the household to make ends meet. And it was only through the patronage of a family friend that Mary Russell was able to attend art school in 1904. That family friend was Mrs. Anne E. Walbridge, and thanks to her, Mary Russell began taking classes at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women when she was just 15. The school was intended as a place where respectable women who found themselves needing to be their own breadwinners could learn how to do so through a career in art. Yeah, this was, you know, talking about post-industrial or part of the Industrial Revolution where there were more and more instances where women were sort of finding themselves needing to figure out how to make an income. And particularly for women from wealthier families, art seemed like a good possibility. And Mary Russell practiced and studied all kinds of art, but she really gravitated toward oils as her preferred medium. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts and then went on to a year of postgraduate work. She wasn't particularly disposed to socializing, but she was generally well-liked by her peers at school. During this time, her mother also remarried. This was something of a surprise, but she remarried a successful publisher named Theodore Presser. And that marriage provided both Elise and her daughter, Mary Russell, financial stability for the rest of their lives. 
After her postgraduate work, Mary Russell and two other students opened their own art studio in downtown Philadelphia where they could all work. She also made money working for museums to restore art, and she did various work-for-hire art projects. Mary Russell at this point was still living with her mother and her stepfather, but uh, she was not getting along particularly well with Theodore Presser. They had just tension between them. So Elise hatched a plan for Mary Russell to take a trip to ease some of that tension in the household. This trip was a hiking expedition in British Columbia in 1909, and Mary Russell really fell in love with the freedom, the hiking, and the terrain of the West. When another opportunity to go on another similar expedition came up the following year, Mary Russell was delighted, and at one of the planning meetings, she met Dr. Harold Sellers Colton, who was a professor of zoology at the University of Pennsylvania. Colton, like Mary Russell, had family money, and his work as a professor was more of a passion than an income generator. Yeah, he really didn't make that much money teaching compared to what he already had in the bank uh, from his family. And he also made some good investments along the way. And Colton was interested in this trip, but the organizer was unsure if he would be suited for it. So he actually asked for Mary Russell's thoughts on the matter since she had been on the previous trip and really knew what it was going to take in terms of endurance and stamina. And she was okay with it, but she and Colton were at best sort of meh about each other. They didn't really hit it off, but they got along well enough and uh, they were in the end both included in this party. During the trip, Harold Colton and another member had separated from the party for a planned side trip to California. And Dr. Charles Shaw, who was the organizer of this expedition, had taken the men by canoe to drop them off. But then he died on his way back to join the main party when the canoe overturned. So once the group was reunited after Dr. Shaw's death, they did continue their travels. And it seems that during that time, Mary Russell and Harold grew closer. And after they returned to Philadelphia, they began a correspondence with one another. Initially, uh, Harold was really more interested in a romantic relationship than Mary Russell was. She was just kind of interested in having uh, a fun, smart friend. But they eventually fell into a courtship, and they were engaged on May 13th, 1911, and married a year later on May 23rd, 1912. The wedding took place in the home of Elise and Theodore, her parents. Mary and Harold's honeymoon proved really pivotal. They traveled once again through the southwestern United States, and Mary fell even more deeply in love with this area. It was a pretty comprehensive trip as well. They visited Glorieta, Santa Fe, and Albuquerque in New Mexico. They traveled through villages all along the Rio Grande and into Arizona, which had only become a state a few months earlier on February 14th. They went to the Grand Canyon and all along the Colorado River Valley, and then they made their way to California. Their journals and notes from this trip identified the American Southwest as a potential home for the two of them. And the couple, though, did continue to live in Pennsylvania. They were in Ardmore at that point, but they made frequent trips west, studying Native American art in particular. The year after their honeymoon, they went back, this time with friends in a much larger party. And for that expedition, Mary Russell and Harold really made an effort to prepare ahead of time and study Navajo and Hopi culture and connect with scholars in the eastern U.S. who had connections to those peoples on the Colorado Plateau. So on that 1913 journey, the Coltons visited several Native American villages, uh, and they happened to be there just as a, a point of trivia at the same time that Theodore Roosevelt was touring the area. Their curiosity also led them to exploring uh, so many areas that their vacations over the next several years actually ended up identifying a number of spots that wound up being of interest to archaeologists. The Colorado Plateau's archaeology surveys started based on locations that the Coltons had recorded as being of interest. And we're going to talk more about their travels and discoveries and their archaeological connections in just a moment. But first, we're going to pause for a little sponsor break. <music> Two years 
end to their marriage, on August 30th, 1914, the Coltons had their first child, a son named Joseph Farrell Colton. And this was the first year that they didn't make it back west in the summer because uh, of the baby's birth. And they also skipped 1915, but they did go back to Flagstaff, Arizona, for an extended visit in 1916. And one of the Coltons' discoveries that would have a lasting impact on research in the area happened that summer, and it was actually thanks to their toddler, who found a broken ceramic piece and handed it to Harold, who identified it as potentially important. And as a result, a decades-long archaeological survey of the area was conducted. Mary Russell and Joseph Farrell stayed in Flagstaff after the summer due to a polio outbreak back in Philadelphia. While Harold went back to his teaching duties, Mary Russell ended up happening upon another site on an autumn horseback ride that led to new information about the prehistoric peoples of the area. These discoveries and others, these are not the only two that they were part of, uh, really got the Coltons excited about the archaeological and anthropological research uh, potential in the Colorado Plateau area. So much so that Harold's interest really started to slowly transition away from zoology, and he started writing more archaeological papers. And Mary Russell was also interested. She co-authored a paper with her husband in 1918, but her interest really remained more intently on the contemporary cultures of the Native Americans in the area. Their second son, Sabin Woolworth Colton IV, was born on September 4th, 1917, that, plus the onset of World War I, in which Harold served uh, in the military intelligence, disrupted their regular visits out west once again. They returned in 1919, and soon they were bringing family and friends with them as they had before the war. Mary Russell lost her mother unexpectedly when Elise died while visiting them out west in 1922. Because Mary Russell was dealing with a combination of shock and grief at this sudden loss, Harold made arrangements for the family to stay in Tucson, Arizona, through the winter and spring instead of returning to Pennsylvania. So in late spring of 1923, they moved from Tucson to Flagstaff. Their youngest son, Sabin, who was six at the time, got sick during their time in Flagstaff, and his ailment was eventually diagnosed as valley fever. This is an infection that develops after inhaling a fungus that's commonly found in dry, arid areas. Uh, The family returned to Philadelphia, but Saban never recovered, and the next year he died on May 3rd, 1924. They had had these two tragedies in a row, but unfortunately there was another one coming. Uh, At the beginning of 1925, the family had to deal again with another loss when Harold's father, Sabin Woolworth Colton Jr., who their son had been named after, died on January 29th. And that year, the Coltons decided to reclaim happier times, and they purchased land that they had been camping on almost every year that they visited Flagstaff, as well as another parcel of land right next to it that had a home built on it. And this was really their first step toward moving to their beloved American Southwest, although they did spend one more winter in Philadelphia before leaving permanently. Mary really loved Flagstaff, but she was underwhelmed at the town's effort to preserve and promote the Native American art and culture in the area. The Women's Club of Flagstaff had assembled a small gallery of things like pottery, baskets, and blankets, but it wasn't nearly as robust a collection as Colton thought that it should be. Mary Russell and Harold envisioned creating a science and art facility that could accommodate a wider scope of Native culture and communicate to visitors and residents alike the environmental and cultural heritage of the Colorado Plateau. Additionally, as Mary Russell and Harold made their uh, nearly yearly trips to the plateau, they had also started seeing archaeological finds packed up and taken away to museums on the East Coast. And they were not the only ones that were noticing that it was strictly a flow out where all of the culture was kind of being taken elsewhere. As early as 1922, local papers were running articles discussing why antiquities from the Colorado Plateau weren't being housed in a museum there in the area. That call to local citizens had been the catalyst for the Flagstaff Women's Club to set up their small collection. But the desire and need for a larger effort to protect the area's local heritage was in the minds of more people than just the Coltons. The Coltons were able to step in and offer some financial resources that had been lacking in this whole project. And as early as 1924, before the couple had made Flagstaff their permanent home, they had paid for display cases at the Women's Club exhibit. Yeah, they really wanted to back this whole effort. So 
uh, as Tracy just said, even before they were really local residents, they were still, they were already giving money to this effort. And in the late summer of 1927, a museum study committee was appointed by the Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce. Harold Colton was on that committee, and Mary Russell was also added after the initial group formed. By December of 1927, a constitution and bylaws for the museum were written. But then there was debate about whether it should be part of a college or a standalone institution. And the Coltons felt strongly that it should exist outside of the confines of a college structure, and it should offer something back to the community whose art and culture it was intending to preserve. In a letter that appeared in the Coconino Sun, Mary Russell wrote, The desirability of the establishment of a museum for the care of our geological, zoological, and archaeological treasures is acknowledged by all, but has the great educational value of a continuity between the ancient and modern native arts been thoroughly considered? Our opportunity for this dual development is exceptional here, located as we are close to the Hopi and Navajo Indians, whose people have instituted the very arts which we are about to go to much pains to preserve today. Those peoples will soon have forgotten the secrets of their crafts, and when they vanish, our country will have lost its only true Native American art. This is our chance to lend them a hand, encourage our Indians to produce only the best using the beautiful old designs available in the museum where they would bring their finest examples of modern Indian craftsmanship for exhibition and sale side by side with the work of the ancient peoples. So, okay, uh, obviously there's some stuff to talk about here. We should make it clear that Colton had good intentions. She really did want to preserve indigenous art and give the native peoples of the Southwest the resources to preserve and develop their own artistic traditions. She tried to get input from those peoples when planning archaeological work and figuring out what to put in the museum's collection and then later on when she worked on educational systems. But at the same time, she was making a lot of these decisions in a pretty paternalistic way, assuming that she knew what was best to preserve another people's heritage. She also wrote about Native American artists and their culture in ways that were simultaneously complimentary and dismissive. She considered this work to be cultural handicraft and not fine art. And this was a pretty common mindset among wealthy white progressives at the time. Additionally, Mary Russell had some concerns about the proposed placement of the museum on college property. She thought that was going to put it in a less affluent part of town which would detract from its mission because no one would want to go see art in a poor neighborhood. Uh, Yeah, she also, one of the other things that becomes tricky when you're reading her writing is that she uses a lot of words that we would separate out today kind of as synonyms. So yeah. she would talk about art, craft, handicrafts, um, you know, other words that were all really referring for her to the same thing, but today have more specific meaning. So that gets a little tricky when you're reading her writing as well. But we are going to delve into where all of this museum discussion led in just a moment. But first, we will take a little break and have a word from a sponsor. So the Coltons continued to advocate pretty vocally for the museum to be an independent entity and not part of a college, uh, and they eventually got their way. And by the end of that year, a nonprofit corporation was founded to govern the museum, that year being 1927, and in May of 1928, a board of trustees was elected. Harold was the Museum of Northern Arizona's Board of Trustees president and museum director, which is the position he was elected to in that May meeting. Mary was the facility's art curator and eventually also became the curator of ethnology. For the next two decades, the couple steered museum's development and direction, and because they were running everything themselves, they had a unique level of autonomy. Researcher William James Burns wrote this in his thesis about Mary Russell Colton. Quote, A potential threat to validity exists when a researcher or institution receives funding for a study from an outside agency, whether federal, state, municipal, or private. The Coltons' independent wealth sheltered their research studies from outside influences. Although they resisted the notion that the museum was theirs, in point of fact, the Coltons funded the institution in full for the first 30 years of its existence, from from 1928 to 1958. Dr. and Mrs. Colton enjoyed the luxury of pursuing studies that they were interested in without having to be concerned about utilitarian purposes for their work or without a funding agency with an agenda encouraging them to push a certain set of values. That's sort of, this will sound um sort of like I am a brilliant student of the blazingly obvious, but that really struck me. I had not considered 
how unusual that situation would be where you set up your own museum. And even though it is a public museum, you could go, no, we're just going to do what we want. Uh, I imagine most people that work in museums today would have a hard time even contemplating what that would be like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and initially, though, the museum was still housed in the Flagstaff Women's Club building. But soon it really grew too large, even after it had expanded from that single room that was there when they moved to Flagstaff to fill the entire clubhouse. So at that point, the museum was basically paying to rent the clubhouse as a museum space. The next additional space was actually annexed in a nearby hotel storefront, but even that was quickly uh, overrun. There was not enough space. So a larger, more permanent space just became more and more of a pressing need. In 1932, 5,500 people visited the museum, and this was noteworthy because there were fewer than 5,500 people living in Flagstaff at the time. Finally, in 1933, after the nonprofit Incorporated, which gave it legal rights to own property, Mary Russell donated 29 acres to the museum, dedicated to her deceased son, Sabin, so that the permanent facility could be built to house this ever-growing collection. The Coltons financed the construction as well. Yeah, the way it tended to work out was that Mary's family money was paying for things like land, and uh, Harold Colton's family money was paying for things like the construction. Mary Russell was, as we alluded to earlier, very focused, particularly on Hopi and Navajo arts. And she was concerned that these cultures were losing their knowledge of the old methods of creating art. And so she sought to bring education programs to the museum and its education efforts that was going to keep them alive. And in her writing about teaching this information, though, she was really careful to instruct teachers to give children and adults alike the tools and knowledge to create using methods that were uh, classic or handed down through Native peoples, but to let the artists make their own decisions about using those tools to express whatever they desired. She also advocated for craftsmen within Hopi and Navajo villages to be chosen as teachers and paid for their work. She really looked at these projects from their absolute base material needs all the way through to their completion. So she wanted weavers to have the best quality wool, so she studied breeds of sheep to find the one that produced the most optimal fibers. She hunted down indigo pigment that was closer to what had been used in legacy Hopi textiles, which was more brilliant and richer in tone than the colors that had come into favor over the years. And in the realm of pottery, she worked to recreate the methods that had once been common in Hopi work. And to achieve this, she not only had to experiment with trying different paints and firing procedures, but she also went so far as to test different soils for the creation of clay to replicate previous methods as closely as possible. Uh, Another idea she promoted was for each community or school to have its own sort of informal mini-museum, where work that had been produced by students could be exhibited and rotated each year. And we've spoken before on the show about the federal Indian boarding school system, which sought to eliminate Native culture from children through a system that was really designed, as we mentioned, particularly in our two-parter on the Fort Shaw women's basketball team to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man. And this approach, which was intended to strip Native American students of their cultural identities, was an utter failure with truly grim and damaging results. So this idea of education was turning a little by the time Mary Russell Colton was implementing her own programs and writing about teaching Native American children. A lot of this shift was thanks to a scathing report on the schools published in 1928 titled, quote, The Problems of Indian Administration, and it was still an issue of discussion. She believed that, quote, teaching them their own crafts when they are young and thus encouraging them to feel a pride of race would go far towards solving some of the most difficult and painful adjustment problems. Colton really thought that it was possible and beneficial for Native American students to get an education that was going to blend both an Anglo and a Native American curriculum. She wasn't really interested in this idea of assimilation that had given rise to those horrible boarding schools. Uh, And she also really believed that education needed to be carefully tailored to each tribal culture where it was being implemented, rather than developing one curriculum that was trying to serve every single village in the same way. She fought aggressively to ensure that all public schools had art as part of the curriculum. She wrote and published a passionate letter to citizens of northern Arizona as an extra publication 
of the museum's newsletter, in which she pleaded, quote, do you know that art education is being deliberately strangled in the public schools? Your children are being deprived of their right to, cr- to a creative education. Art education is both a practical and liberal education in life and is closely, inextricably correlated with every other subject in the school. Our enlightened country should feel shame indeed at having countenanced for a moment such a backward step in education. And in 1929, just four years after the Coltons moved permanently to Arizona, Mary held the Arizona Artists Exhibitions. And in these shows, local artists had an opportunity to share their work with an audience and promote what they had to offer. This was, in her mind, also a way for them to generate an income. This exhibition was very successful, and it continued to be an annual event for the next six years. As an offshoot of the exhibition success, as a teaching tool, Mary Russell Colton created a traveling exhibit that she could take around to schools and to other museums to show collections that featured art from a variety of Native American cultures and explained the techniques that were used to create them. Traveling educational shows were called treasure chests. Yeah, sometimes they would just circulate. She wouldn't necessarily go with them, but they would like go to a school with a uh, little curriculum uh, explainer included for teachers to kind of talk through with kids what was in the box and they could have them for a couple weeks at a time. It was kind of an interesting idea. She was not the first person to come up with that idea. There were other things. Uh, there were other educators that were trying similar concepts. Uh, but Mary Russell Colton really wanted to ensure that the children of this area were getting both an education in local art history, as evidenced by these touring teaching exhibitions, and also she wanted to make sure that future generations were going to learn and preserve the art techniques and methods that were part of their cultural history. To that end, she started a junior art show for grade school children to share their work in 1931. She felt very passionately that all children should receive art lessons, no matter what future career or life they might have. And after several years of working with children and developing a curriculum for teaching art, in 1934, Colton wrote a book to teach other educators in the region titled Art for the Schools of the Southwest, an outline for the public and Indian schools. This very busy and productive time in Mary's life was not something that she could sustain, though. She turned back to her own art, started painting again, but at the same time, she turned away from most social activities. She increasingly stayed home. Eventually, she was diagnosed with arthrosclerosis of the brain, which is a condition in which there's a thickening or stiffening of the brain's arterial walls. This is associated with certain types of dementia, and it puts patients at a high risk for stroke. In 1948, Mary stopped working full-time at the museum. Her husband, Harold, though, continued the programs that she had begun. And as she planned to leave her job, she worked on writing down ideals that would guide the museum's art department after she was gone. And those were to stimulate Native American arts and crafts, to foster creativity in the community, and to present the museum's scientific information artfully. Even when Mary Russell retired, she still had a position of authority at the museum as chair of the museum's art committee. She could continue to steer the policies and decisions without the burden of her full-time position. She was chair of the art committee for a decade, stepping down in 1958. That same year, she also had an exhibition of her own paintings. And Harold retired from his position as director the following year, 1959. When the museum celebrated its 25th anniversary, Mary Russell attended the celebration, but her health had really started to decline. Uh, Harold Colton died on December 29th of 1970, and Mary died the following year on July 16th, 1971. She was 82 at the time. She was buried outside of Philadelphia in a cemetery where her family had a plot. And finally, Holly wanted to include a sentiment that Mary Russell wrote as part of a paper titled Art as a Personal and Economic Necessity, because it really encapsulates why she was so passionate about art and about sharing it and teaching it. We travel rough roads in life, and we all know that there are many joys that slip away and many disappointments along the road. But if we have a love of beauty, life will hold many satisfactions for us, which we cannot lose. And we can feel that it has been worthwhile. 
I have listener mail. I have two pieces of listener mail today. Oh, good. Uh, they are both about um, Mary Breckenridge, and they're both very, fairly brief, so I thought we had time to do both of them. Uh, our first one is from Christine, and she said, I just finished listening to your episode about Mary Breckenridge and her work, especially in Appalachia. I know that is pronounced differently by different people. However you like to pronounce it is great. Uh, reminded me of our own local hero. Dr. Kate Newcomb was a doctor in northern Wisconsin in the 1930s in our rural area. Like Mary, she came to a place where there was not an established system of medical care for residents, and she helped to establish it. During the harsh winters, instead of traveling by horse, she gained the nickname Angel on Snowshoes as she would find a way to her patients however she could. Eventually, she too wanted to start a hospital, and for fun, she turned to an unexpected source, school children. Kids at a local school wanted to see what a million somethings would look like, so they collected one million pennies, and they donated the funds to Dr. Kate's hospital. I'm a local teacher, and I always make sure we do some hometown history uh, research so that students can learn about Dr. Kate and other local heroes. Uh, keep up your great work. I refer my students to the podcast as a way to learn a little bit more about whatever we're studying. Thank you, Christine, for being an educator. And also, what a great story. I think there are so many um, unsung people in the medical industry that have, have done similar things throughout the years. So I'm glad any of them get a little more attention. Uh, the other one is from our listener, Jenny. She says, hi, I wanted to drop a quick line of thanks for the many hours of listening joy you've given me. I've listened to years, first when I was living in Egypt, where you'd keep me company on my walk to and from work, and now in Iraq as I try to film the many hours of relative boredom. Uh, she works for the UN, and she spends a lot of time on the road flying around uh uh, or simply in a car driving around northern Iraq to work camps for people displaced by conflict over the last few years. I always feel like I have a couple of friends with me talking about super interesting things, which helps keep my mind from stressing about falling out of the sky, she's afraid of flying, or from endlessly dwelling on the many horrible suf stories of suffering we hear in the camps. I found your episode on Mary Breckenridge especially interesting, as many of the medical issues she was dealing with, we are still grappling with as well. Ensuring that children have access to quality health Healthcare in a combat post-war setting is tremendously challenging. I won't go into the gory details here, just mention that the parallels between her work in World War I and our current work are quite striking. It's amazing how, while the methods of war have changed, the work to be done in the aftermath has not. Uh, she wrote a really great blog post about uh, the challenges of working for children's health in in Iraq, uh, and she thanks us to the many happy hours of listening. Jenny is another person who should be thanked for her efforts, because that sounds like a very very stressful and demanding job, and I'm glad someone wonderful is doing it. Uh, but it is interesting that Mary Breckenridge brings up all of these these uh, ideas of parallelism because there are still plenty of places in the world that need help, too. So I just wanted to read both of those since one reaches into the past, one into our current timeline, uh, and they're both very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to mention at the end of our Mary Russell Colton that there is a, a secondary story about her that I want to explore, I think, in a separate podcast. So in case any of you know about her and you go, why did you not mention the Philadelphia 10, which was a group of women artists that were all uh, exhibiting together. And she was part of that. Uh, and it evolved. It wasn't always the same women, but mm -hmm. it's an interesting story. And so uh, if you're wondering why we didn't mention that, it's because I'm saving it for the future. <laughs> And because I wanted to focus more on her work uh, in the American Southwest. So that's what's up with that. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also find us pretty much anywhere on social media as Mist in History. MistInHistory.com is also our website where you can find every episode that has ever existed long before Tracy and I were involved with the show, uh, as well as show notes for any of the episodes that Tracy and I have worked on. So come on and visit us at MistInHistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 